a friend of mine saying, I forget the exact date, um, but there was a time when this, the ulama, the, the Islamic scholars at Al-Azhar University, the most, one of the most, if not the most prestigious seat of learning in the, in the Muslim world, were, were obviously scholars and independent. And they, there was a time in the 20th century, it might have been under Nasser, I forget when, uh, when they became employees of the yeah. state, they became civil servants. Yes. Can you imagine? I mean, imagine the change that meant when the state actually employs you. Are you going to criticize the state? Are you then going to accept its directives, its programs, its encouragements, perhaps to maybe not say this and maybe look at that? You're not independent anymore. And but it gave them job security because they were employed by the state, but at a huge cost. And and so that I don't want to criticize that institution directly. I know nothing about it, but it, it does seem that they are now civil servants, whereas before they were independent. And that surely that is significant. Yes, and and that's actually one of the beauties of, of specifically that book is Halak goes into uh, uh, a lot of detail and and skips around the Muslim world to show the, the process, and it mostly happened across the 1800s, particularly the latter half of the 1800s. Um, we're talking Algeria, we're talking Egypt, we're talking even even the Ottoman Empire, um, India, Pakistan, Indonesia. The playbook was always the same. And it comes right back to that state sovereignty that he talks about and what you just kind of illustrated is that that in order for state sovereignty to be asserted, the first thing that they did when they came to Muslim lands was break up the waqfs. They broke up the waqf, they seized the property, their underlying assets. It could no longer function independently. It had to be subsumed within a department of this, department of education, department of property. But sometimes it was as crude as those underlying assets being put back on the market and returned to circulation. But sometimes they let them exist, but they exactly like with Al Azhar, they appropriated the usufruct or they meddled with the, um, they salaried everybody and they yes. brought them under the centralized control yes. of, the, of the sovereign state. And so that was maybe even more significant. This is where Halak would draw a distinction between sort of like pre modern colonialism, which is kind of your Columbus and your, these guys who are just going for conversion and stealing gold and, you know, barbarism and things like that, yes. versus once we get to the 18th. Uh, excuse me, the, the 19th century, the 1800s, um, it's kind of a different flavor. That's where his definition of modernity really kicks off, where um, it's about the sovereign state, it's yes. about control, it's about controlling the internal subject, producing an entirely new subject. And this is where we get quotes from all the colonial administrators, you know, we want to kill the Indian and save the man, or, you know, we want people who are uh, Indian in their color and in their, etc., but they're they're British in their mannerisms and their opinions and et cetera, et cetera. This type of thinking where we want to keep the thin superficial diversity, but the internal diversity, we want to crush it. We want to make sure that there is no subjectivity except for a subjectivity that is obedient to the secular state and its logic. Um, and so that's where they reformed uh, law codes. Halak goes into a lot of detail about reforming of the legal codes mm -hmm. and compares the, the Sharia and all of its mm -hmm. kind of um, you know, it's, it's local sensitivities, it's decentralized nature uh, versus the kind of codification of law that became very rigid and inflexible and, and centralized, again, from Morocco to Indonesia, like he skips across the Muslim world and shows how this is only uh, possible with, within this sort of episteme that demands this sort of totalitarian control of the internal self. This did not exist. This is unprecedented. That's how Locke's claim. And I love that unprecedented. And, and that's the point. I mean, he's very critical in the impossible state, which by which he means the Islamic state in a, a conceived a modern state is impossible because of those reasons. Simply to Islamicize the modern state is not is is a, is a contradiction in terms. The, the Islamic governance has always been very different, been more de decentralized. There's been these independent uh, uh, agencies like uh, the ulama. Uh, and so on. It's not this absolute state, this unprecedented phenomenon we see, we see today, which he, which he says is very un-Islamic. You can't just Islamize it. You have to have a different paradigm. Uh, although I'm not sure he talks about the alternative paradigm in that book. But um, and this is a central question for Muslims, of course, in terms of the caliphate, uh, which I think is a really important subject. Different area, of course, of discourse from us now. But uh, he, he makes some very profound points. And for Christians to make these points. For a Muslim audience who are appreciating what he's saying is also unprecedented, I think. Yes, very much so. Yeah, and I mean, we see the illustrations of, of those points now, right? You look at look at all the examples that we have of a state-sponsored Islam. Yeah. You know, we have without 
naming names, everybody knows, you know, the sort of the, when the state gets behind Islam, it's always with an agenda. It's impossible not to. And so they're in the process of curating that tradition to mm-hmm. something that's amenable to their own interests. Um, and then because it's the sovereignty of the state that's at, that's at stake, um, they're going to be very, very ready to declare anything and everything else as not Islam, as heresy, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's actually a very precarious thing. We can't have just an Islam that's simply sprinkled on top of uh, the same forms and the same episteme that yeah. has produced the, the modern state. We really do need a, a paradigm shift, uh, as it were. Um, yeah. But, yeah. And it just shows me really great ironies uh, of our, our time in the West. If you really want to be radical, if you want to be a subversive, you want to be a, a revolutionary, don't become an anarchist. Don't become a Marxist because a lot of your Marxist radical views are culturally dominant. They're in the media. They're fashionable. Corporations are shouting your slogans now. If you really want to be a radical revolutionary, you've got to be subversive. Be a Muslim. I mean, yeah, very much be, so. Be a, or, or be a traditionalist. I mean, there are traditional Catholics and others who occupy a similar kind of space in that kind of subversive area. But Muslims are the, by far the biggest and un, un, unsubverted uh religion in the world though and it's muslims are the real they're not a threat that they are a potential hope for a different paradigm that could bring a uh, much more holistic healing and liberation for humanity so it's not a dangerous threat it's actually a, an alternative for hope where secular models and discourses just don't offer any answers about what is the meaning to life how do we live our lives how do we relate to god is there an afterlife what does it mean to be good that, that, that this discourse has nothing really to give no answers really but religion does have answers and islam preeminently ha- has uh, the complete set of answers arguably um to offer mankind and, and that's the great hope i think of religion um where, where liberalism can't offer any answers really yes no that, that's that's i think one of the most important things especially to drive home to non-muslims is that uh look at the society that we're in everybody is sick Everybody's sick uh, when it comes to there's the, the drug addiction and pornography and, and, and your media and everything. People are living, living miserable lives. And it's impressive the degree to which corporate mass media is able to convince people that they are living in the most free and happy time that has ever existed, the pinnacle of progress of Western civilization. We've got the best of the Greeks and the best of Christianity and the best of this and the best of that. And yet everybody's sick. We're killing the earth, you know, that we're destroying the environment. Uh, nobody's happy. Right? And uh, there's this kind of uh, cognitive dissonance that, that people have yet to admit. But I think if they admit it, then they need to start looking for, for alternatives and for redemption. Uh, that's, that's the word that I like to use, that Islam has the redemption of the West or any place inside of it. Uh, and that, again, last hope. It's the last hope because yes. the kind of... Uh, whether it's the secular state or whether it's kind of the corporate interests or neoliberal capitalism has successfully managed to, to co-opt every other sort of movement and resistance, as you said, you know, and now you've got, you've got uh, pride flags on, on, on warheads that get dropped on countries, right? That's just like a perfect metaphor for um, the trivialization of what people incorrectly assume is some sort of liberatory uh you know worldview or something like that uh, I, I saw i saw a recent, recent prior i won't mention what it is but there was a a, a, a u.s army uh a, advert uh or military advert i'm not the army or not and had a picture of a helmet and it had a picture of four bullets strapped to the helmet and this is an official military u.s military advert by the way and they were all gay pride things like gay bullets basically <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is you can you can go and fight and kill the enemy with some gay bullets in the name of that i mean it, it, it is unthinkable that this has been done five minutes ago and now this is now official propaganda yes. uh, lgbt bullets that will kill the enemy i mean right. presumably muslims or, or yes. um, unbelievable and if, that doesn't make, if that doesn't make people stop and think i don't know what will because people exactly. need to realize the ways in which they're being used and even their 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 good mm-hmm. sensibilities of justice or their sympathies are being used and co-opted Right. All of these things are part of the same cultural force, the same global monoculture that's kind of being uh, shoved down our throats. And the only thing left, the only thing left to resist it is Islam. So mm-hmm. and if we sacrifice, as you were saying, that the sad thing is that if we sacrifice that Islam in order to fit in and curate our tradition and for the sake of political alliances, 
we're going to lose the exact thing that stands to redeem mm. the place that we live in and everybody in it. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, um, I guess that's it. Well, th thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Imam Tom, for uh, your prodigious reading and your time. And uh, I, I, I will, um, I'll itemize the books that you've mentioned in the description below, as well as put a link to um, your mosque and your YouTube channel, which is definitely worth uh, following. You're very, very active on YouTube, producing some very good quality content on a on a daily, almost hourly basis. Sometimes I feel it's 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 uh, a great output there. Um, and um, well, thank you very much, um, Imam Tom, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Pleasure. Take them until next time.